Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Ford Presidential Library, especially on such a gorgeous spring evening. I'm honored that you would come into the building when it's so lovely outside. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my privilege to serve as director of the library here in Ann Arbor and also the museum in Grand Rapids. Tonight's program is brought to you by the National Archives and Records Administration, which is our parent organization, with additional support from the Ford Presidential Foundation. And it's the foundation and your support of the foundation which makes possible all of our public programs and events. Tonight's program is being video recorded, so when we get to the Q&A after the main program, please go to the microphone at the back of the center aisle so that your questions will be recorded for future broadcast. And finally, the standard matter of housekeeping, if you would please make sure cell phones and other electronic devices are turned off, we'd appreciate it. It's a pleasure to welcome Ken Walsh back with us this evening. This is his fourth talk at either the library or museum since 2009, when he first spoke about o President Obama's first year in office. Ken has also been here as a researcher, so to us he's kind of a member of the family, and it's nice to have him with us. Mr. Walsh covers the White House and politics for US News. He writes the daily blog, Ken Walsh's Washington, for usnews.com, and the presidency column for US News Weekly. In addition to this work, Ken is on, active on multiple television networks and cable programs, along with N NPR on the radio. And in case you haven't heard it, I think you could find a wonderful interview he did on C-SPAN Book Talk describing the book. And it's, uh, it's, it's very well done. He's a great storyteller. Ken is the former president of the White House Correspondents Association and has won the most prestigious awards for White House coverage. He is also a three-time winner of the Gerald R. Ford Journalism Prize for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency, which was regarded by many journalists as the Academy Award of their field. Ken is one of the longest serving White House correspondents in history. He has covered the presidency, presidential campaigns, and national politics since 1986, spanning the presidencies of Ronald Reagan through Barack Obama and traveling to over 60 countries as a part of his work. That's a pretty amazing record. And if that isn't enough, Ken is a prolific author. He is the author now of seven books covering various aspects of the presidency and told us this afternoon he already has a book contract for the next one. He loves to write and he loves to share it with us. Ken's colleagues say that he is an old school journalist who knows how to find secrets and then knows which ones can be told and which ones can, must be kept longer or even forever. <laughs> Presidential historian Doug Weed notes that Walsh has direct, one-on-one, -on -one, ongoing contact with most presidents. And this at, contact means, leads to a balancing act for, of the need for a good story with the need for future access to that president. <laughs> and that's its own political skill set. So ladies and gentlemen, please help all of us in welcoming our friend and colleague and respected author, Ken Walsh, back to the Ford Library. Well, th thank you, Elaine. Can you all hear me OK? Um, I always love coming back to the Ford Library and Museum. I, as Elaine said, I've done it a number of times now. I'm a big fan of the presidential library system. Uh, I do a lot of research there. They're wonderful sites to uh, explain to the public not only presidential history but American history. Uh, I was actually at the Fra Franklin Roosevelt Library giving a talk earlier this week and um, so I'm I, uh, making the rounds of the presidential libraries now but I always particularly love to come here. Uh, wonderful turnout, very engaged audiences and um, I know wonderful questions. Often better questions than we ask in the White House press corps I might add. <laughs> but um, people ask uh, all the time, you know, where do you get your ideas for your books and so on. Well, this particular book uh, struck me that um, we are living in such a celebrity-driven culture in the United States now that the presidents have to be not only the commander-in-chief or the chief executive or the administrator-in-chief, but they have to have a certain entertainer dimension now, and a lot of traditional folks really don't like this because it, they feel it lowers the stature of the presidency. But I think that presidents have learned, and certainly in the time that I've covered the White House, they're 29 years now, that presidents have to be celebrity in chief. They have to learn how to enhance and harness their celebrity 
and channel it in ways that bring positive attention to the president and the president's agenda. They also need to uh, represent some fundamental American values as the celebrity in chief. In the book, I distinguish between hollow celebrity and consequential celebrity, the notion that uh, a hollow celebrity that we think of like the star of a sitcom or something like that, it's different than somebody who, uh, as a president or a political figure, would use celebrity in positive ways and, and um, represent fundamental American values or verities. Franklin Roosevelt, for instance, optimism and pragmatism. Uh, president Kennedy, also the sense of, uh, of optimism, the sense of a new generation of youth and vigor. Um, there's many examples of this, and which I'll talk about a little bit. And then the president needs to have a sense of the news media of the president's era and how to use the news media to enhance his own celebrity in positive ways, as I say. And then finally, participate, understanding and participating in popular culture. This has become more and more important as Americans want the president to understand them and their problems. And you see this in polls constantly now that Americans want the president to feel, to make them feel that he understands them, maybe someday she understands them, and that um, the president uh, really gets it as what's going on in the country. Because uh, the last book I wrote was called Prisoners of the White House, which I, where I talked about presidential isolation, and I've given that discussion a number of times. Uh, this is an example, this book, of how presidents can avoid that and, and connect with the country. So that's sort of the, those are the threads that I weave through the book and that I hope to talk to you about for the next while, and then we'll take some questions. Um, but the conclusion I reach is that the presidents who are best at being celebrities in chief are the presidents who are most effective leaders, and those who do not master this are, are less effective leaders. And so we'll talk about that a little bit starting now. Um, the first president was the first celebrity in chief, George Washington. George Washington was considered the indispensable man while he was uh, rising to fame in the United States. Of course, he was the general who led the colonies out of um, their, their time as part of uh, Great Britain. Um, he was the hero of the Revolutionary War. This is a depiction of George Washington uh, crossing the Delaware. This is the heroic George Washington that people uh, expected to see as president. Um, he, as commander-in-chief, uh, he understood that he would have to use his celebrity to set precedents that the country would use for the rest of its life. As the first president, he understood this concept. When he took office, he was elected, first of all, by the electors at the time unanimously, twice. We're never going to see that again. <laughs> um, and um, when he made his way from Mount Vernon, Virginia, his estate to the temporary capital in New York, the president's residence. It was like he was treated as what we would think today of as a rock star. Everywhere he went, people wanted to come up and say hello to him, wanted to greet him, wanted to sort of t touch him to get a sense of this great man of his time. And uh, he, his feeling was that the president should be accessible, so it took him a long time to make that journey from Virginia to New York because he was so accessible. He was talking to people all the time. He established that precedent that the president should not be beyond the public. Uh, even to the extent where they tried to come up with the name for this new figure, the American president. Some of them very highfalutin. I remember when I particularly was taken by was his high mightiness and lord of the realm. Well, <laughs> George Washington decided that Mr. President will be just fine. And that's the name that, that the president has to this day. Um, when Washington uh, finally reached New York, this is a depiction of him crossing the Hudson River, um, there were barges and vessels and ships and they fired off cannons to greet him. They had these oarsmen and you can see there wearing yellow jackets um, crossing the river with him. And he was actually a little bit intimidated by the whole thing and he wrote in his diary later and confided to friends that he didn't know if he was going to be up to the job. He said this is a, this is a, this is a, a country that's established by divine intervention, he felt, and he didn't know if he could um, live up to its ideals, but of course he did, and he is a president who we still revere. When historians do analyses of the greatest presidents, the first three are almost always George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Franklin Roosevelt. So we started off with a celebrity president, and it's been hard for a lot of presidents to live up to that. 
Well, fast forward, I can't talk about all the presidents, but I'll give you some highlights of things I talk about in the book. Abraham Lincoln, when he ran for president in 1860, he was thought of initially as an ignorant frontiersman. <clears throat> this is the image that people had of Abraham Lincoln at the time. The rail splitter, the, the guy who uh, wasn't part of the sophisticated cities of New York or Baltimore or Philadelphia. He was a guy from what was thought of as the frontier. And so he knew he had to establish a different kind of celebrity, a more sophisticated celebrity, and harness that to be elected president. So he decided that he would call, call upon the people around him and himself to redo his image. He realized that he had, he had to give a speech in New York City to very important folks at a Cooper Union. This, the Cooper Union speech is a very famous speech that Lincoln gave. And he succeeded in establishing himself as an intellectual leader at the time. But he also realized that the image was important. So he went to the studio of Matthew Brady, the famous Civil War photographer, and asked that his picture be taken because he wanted to use it in his campaign. So he wanted to come across as the erudite leader of the future. He walked into Matthew Brady's studio and Matthew Brady was horrified because he said, this is not a good looking man. <laughs> uh, and you know, at the time they took pictures of, of the political figures with the head shot and shoulders. And Matthew Brady said, if I use this, nobody's going to vote for you because, you, you know, look, look, look how you look, Mr. Lincoln. And Lincoln shows up in a wrinkled suit and a wrinkled shirt. So Matthew Brady figures, well, what am I going to do? So what he did is he came up with this. He pulls the camera back. He it takes advantage of Lincoln's stature. You don't see the wrinkles, you don't see the, the complexion and so on. He puts cleverly Lincoln's left hand on a book. So anybody who looks at the picture gets a little sense of erudition and so on. And this was a very popular picture. This was very successful for Lincoln in looking like a man who could be president, a man who had the stature and gravitas to be president. So it was an early example of presidential public relations that have become so important in our history. After he was elected, he grew a beard. He grew a beard as he was taking office. And what they did is they did an early form of photoshopping. They drew the beard on this picture. <laughs> so for many people around the country, they had pictures of Lincoln with this drawn in beard. Uh, now, then he had other pictures taken. And I'd like to just show you, a lot of people are interested in sort of just presidential, what the presidency does to presidents as a little side like This is Lincoln in his first year in office a photo taken of him as a resolute, uh, strong, decisive leader. This is him four years later, shortly before he was assassinated. And look at the wear that the office has taken on him. Uh, takes office four years later. He almost looks like a spectral presence. He almost looks like a ghost-like figure. The Civil War has worn him down. Now, at this point, the Union is winning the Civil War. The Union is about to win the Civil War. So he's now taking on a special iconic image in the country as a guy who's finally gotten us through the Civil War, who's finally kept the Union together, the great emancipator, he's abolished slavery. So he's taken on, uh, as particularly among African Americans, among freed slaves, a spiritual persona as Father Abraham, as he was starting to be called. Then when he was assassinated, this took off and he became a martyred president, so he became in death in particular, a, a incredible celebrity, a huge larger than life figure. And this is the kind of image that was associated with Lincoln for many years. Lincoln arriving in heaven, greeted by George Washington <laughs> and the angels. <laughs> so, uh, and you, so this was, uh, this was part of the sort of the Lincoln legacy. You know, how can you top that? Um, but now again, we'll fast forward a little bit more closer to the modern era. Theodore Roosevelt. This is Theodore Roosevelt as the leader of the Rough Riders, the cavalry detachment he led in the Spanish-American War. You can see him there in the center of the picture in front of the American flag to your little bit to the left with the suspenders on. Um, he was a very brave soldier and he felt that the war was actually something that was good for the country because it would bring out the strength and bravery and um, positive aspects of, of men in, under pressure. So he was always a believer in war, as a, as a character builder, actually. Um, and uh, he used this image to enhance his celebrity. We like in America every so often to elect military heroes, and he was one of them. 
and this helped propel him. He was named, after he was governor of New York, he was named vice president. And when William McKinley, who was the president at the time, was assassinated, and so Theodore Roosevelt took over. But from the beginning, he understood the power of celebrity, how he had to enhance his celebrity and build it into positive ways. Among the ways he did this, he understood the media of his time, newspapers, and he understood that the publishers of the country, the owners of the papers, would never be supportive of him. He took out after uh, big corporations and conglomerates. He condemned what he called the malefactors of great wealth. So he understood that the rich and powerful would not support him, but he could appeal to the common people. And the way he did that was by getting to know the reporters who wrote the stories, not the publishers who owned the newspapers. The reporters were writing the stories about him, and he was very clever, and he understood that. Uh, he understood the media of his time and how to dominate it. So he released all kinds of interesting tidbits about himself, about his family, um, about uh, him being a big game hunter, about what he called the strenuous life, where he felt that people in the United States should seek to achieve everything possible in their private and public lives. And this became a uh, fabulous part of his celebrity while he was president. <clears throat> a famous story about Teddy uh, Roosevelt, the teddy bear. Uh, talk about intersecting with popular culture. This is a cartoon at the time. That's where we get the name of the teddy bear from this incident. He went hunting in Mississippi and he wanted to, to shoot a bear. Well, he was hunting and he was unable to shoot a bear, so the guide found a baby bear that they trapped and brought the little bear into the camp for the president to shoot. <laughs> so as you can see, Teddy Roosevelt is waving it off. No, this is unfair, this is unsportsmanlike. Free the teddy, free the bear. So this incident, as I say, they released the story to the media and it became a fabulous story. And some uh, toy manufacturers started making bears, which they called teddy bears, and it became very popular. So this is where we get the name. So it was a perfect intersection of celebrity and the presidency. Um, he also called attention to his agenda on conservation by using his celebrity. He traveled around the country. He, uh, they managed to release photographs of things. This is him visiting Yosemite with John Muir, the famous naturalist. And so he called attention to his desire to save America's great open spaces and so on. So he really mastered a lot of the techniques and invented a lot of the techniques of celebrity that the presidents have used ever since. Um, Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt was, I think, the first modern president and the first celebrity president uh, in, in full. Uh, he managed to um, attach himself to many of the stars of Hollywood at the time. This is the first time presidents had done this. He understood that movies were becoming very popular and the movie folks like Roosevelt, they thought they could enhance their luster and personality by associ associating with him and he felt the same by associating with them. So these are some of the top movie stars of the time, of the 1930s. If you look carefully at the photograph, you can pick out some people. I mean, I frankly don't know who some of these people are, but I can, I, I can identify Bob Hope, James Cagney, Pat O'Brien, Claudette Colbert, Laurel and Hardy. Um, and there's Eleanor Roosevelt in the very center of the picture with the white dress on. And so you can see they're using the White House as a backdrop for this connection uh, who, yeah, who else do you recognize? Where's FDR? Well, he wasn't in the picture. Part of the, part of the reason was he didn't want people to know he was paralyzed. His legs were paralyzed. So they didn't want to bring him out in front of the photographers and have him be carried to the scene, which would have had to happen because, or use the wheelchair. So anyway, but Eleanor hosted them. But there were many other occasions where he associated with celebrities. This is uh, a case where he goes to a baseball game. Um, Presidents and sports I talk about in the book a lot because this is another way that presidents connect with everyday America through sports. Uh, remember that the tradition of throwing out the first baseball, presidents have done that since Taft for a long, long time. And, and Roosevelt did that too, but as you can see, he loves the crowd, he loves to work the crowd, he loves to be associated with everyday people, and you can see this on his way to the game. He understood the media of his time, not only newspapers, as his cousin did, Theodore Roosevelt, he understood to work with the reporters rather than the publishers, but he also understood that radio was the coming um, medium. 
And so he did, delivered the fireside chats, the fireside chats where he talked directly to the country. Many, many American families had radios in their homes. There were accounts at the time where they were announced that he was giving a fireside chat. He understood show business very well because he understood he could wear out his welcome. He only did 30 fireside chats in 12 years. So he wasn't doing them like every week, but um, he did them uh, often enough that he was a presence in people's homes and lives. His voice was very distinctive and people recognized his voice. There are accounts uh, from the time where he would, people would walk down streets and cities and towns People would have their windows open, and you could hear Frank and Roosevelt giving the fireside chat by walking down the street and not miss a word, because people were listening to these things very carefully, because he was trying to reassure the country, getting back to that notion of capturing values and representing values and, and verities, that to be optimistic, we'll get through the Depression, we'll win the war, World War II, and people associated all this with Frank and Roosevelt. Um, this is uh, after Roosevelt left office, Harry Truman took over. Now, uh, he made some mistakes in dealing, <laughs> in dealing with celebrities. This is actually a photograph when he was vice president. He was giving a speech in Washington and he decided he'd play the piano. He loved to play the piano, loved to play the Missouri waltz and so on. And um, Lauren Bacall, a rising starlet of the time, on the advice of her publicist, decided to get some attention and jumped on the piano. <laughs> Now, Harry doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know where to look. <laughs> uh, he's just quite uncomfortable. Lauren Bacall looks pretty self-possessed, doesn't she? Um, but uh, so he plays one number, and then he, he gets away from the piano. And his wife, <laughs> Bess, later said, don't ever do that again. You know, um, you, you looked entirely like you were too interested in Lauren Bacall. So, so this taught him a lesson. And from then on, he really didn't like to associate with celebrities. He just didn't think he had much to say to them. He didn't understand their lives and so on, or how they would intersect with his life. So he really didn't capitalize on celebrity very much. Initially, he was popular uh, following up on Franklin Roosevelt's programs. Of course, he won that famous 1948 election coming from behind. But then in the next four years, he faded. And by the end of his presidency, partly because of the Korean War, partly because he couldn't connect with popular culture, because, uh, partly because people felt he wasn't doing what they wanted him to do, his popularity really faded. Uh, and so he was actually quite an unpopular president when he left office. And the celebrity factor became quite low with Harry Truman. Uh, he tried, as I say, to do certain things that connect. This is another case where he tries to show he's uh, trying to keep fit and trim. But uh, again, we get to that notion of uh, stature and gravitas that didn't quite work out. President Eisenhower comes into office. And President Eisenhower was a hero of World War II, of course. He was a supreme Allied commander. He led the Allied forces in Normandy and through the invasion of Europe. So he didn't have anything to prove. Um, this is a picture of him as a military officer. One thing that people uh, liked about Eisenhower is he promised to bring normalcy to the country after the war and after the Depression. People just wanted to settle down, live their lives, have some prosperity, and that's what he brought to the country. Uh, this Eisenhower jacket, as they called it, actually became quite popular at the time. Some of you might remember that. Um, but he didn't want to participate in popular culture. He didn't want to uh, really be a celebrity in chief, but he was a, quite a popular president because of his policies and because he brought uh, to the country what uh, the country wanted at the time. Uh, one thing he did do is he intersected to the country with sports. He was a tremendous golfer. This is Eisenhower with Arnold Palmer, very young looking Arnold Palmer. And Eisenhower loved to play golf and he was criticized for it because his critics said he was playing too much golf. Uh, but he did play a lot of golf and uh, always defended. He wrote a famous essay saying that every man, woman, and child in the country should learn golf and play it because it's a wonderful family activity that people can use to keep, to keep their families uh, happy and active. And by the end of his presidency, he had, had re, uh, regenerated interest in golf. So people actually uh, liked golf and uh, a lot more golf courses were built during the Eisenhower years. Now, then we got to President Kennedy. President Kennedy was another celebrity in chief. He was elected partly because of his glamour, because of the glamour of his wife Jacqueline. This is a picture of them at their home in Hyannisport, Massachusetts with young John Jr. Uh, President Kennedy understood the country was ready for more excitement, uh, more of a sense of movement and energy in the White House and he projected that during his campaign. 
He was always interested throughout his life in the intersection between show business and politics. His dad, jo Joseph Kennedy, was not only a wealthy investor, of one of the wealthiest men in the country, but he was a Hollywood producer. People tend to forget he produced movies. He knew a lot of the figures in Hollywood at the time, and he always wanted his son to understand that he needed to be a celebrity in what his father felt was the modern age in order to be the most effective leader. And President Kennedy understood that, and so he intersected with celebrity in many ways. He was associating with some of the ma main stars, like Frank and Roosevelt had done. This is him, Fred Frank Sinatra, in one of his inaugural balls. He associated with many of the leading um, political and, uh, and um, entertainment figures of his time. And uh, he understood also the right power of television. As Franklin Roosevelt had understood radio, he understood television. And so he was terrific at giving television performances, news conferences, interviews. Um, Jacqueline Kennedy also brought the networks in to give tours of the White House. You remember having seen some of these. And she was very good at it. And you know they use some of the techniques we use now, like she's giving a tour of the White House. And oh, in the middle of the tour, the president shows up. Oh, what a surprise. <laughs> Gets a little 10 minute interview on television. That's what they did. And um, so anyway, he masters television and he represents the values of sort of vigor, can do spirit and optimism and so on. Uh, some people felt that Kennedy went too far with his focus on celebrity. This is a, <laughs> you know what I'm gonna get into here. Um, President Kennedy, of course, has had the famous birthday party where Marilyn Monroe came out and sang before like 10,000 people with President Kennedy in the front row smoking a big cigar. Happy birthday, Mr. President. You might have seen the clips of this. She comes out in a, in a wrap and she takes it off and she's wearing a skin tight dress, which is, this is the dress. This is a very rare picture taken of Kennedy greeting her with his brother Bobby after the, um, after the event. And she sings this very sultry version of Happy Birthday. And uh, he goes up on the, uh, the platform later and he says, I know that I've succeeded in my life now because I've had a happy birthday sung to me in such a sweet and innocent way by Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Not really. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in any case, so the question there is whether he was going too far with the celebrity connection. Of course, the assassination, we don't know how far that would have gone. But there's no indication that he would have been any less of a celebrity present probably even more because he understood all these dynamics of our increasingly celebrity-driven culture. Um, this is the single most requested photograph <laughs> in the National Archives of the presidency. Nixon and Elvis. And I can tell you what happened. Elvis Presley was a big fan of law enforcement. And he decided that he wanted to go to the White House and see if the president would give him some kind of a law enforcement badge that he could use to catch the bad guys, particularly drug offenders. Now, it's ironic because he was an abuser of prescription drugs himself. So he shows up at the Northwest Gate. He goes to one of the Secret Service guards. You know, talk about security. Well, in those days, there was some at the White House. You didn't have the fence jumpers that you do now. Uh, the guy, he shows up and he says, I'm Elvis Presley, I'd like to see the president. The guard says, oh yeah, sure, you're Elvis Presley, yeah. So he presents his ID, the guard calls the president's office, uh, an aide comes out and it's Elvis. He brings him in and they contact the president and President Nixon says, I don't wanna to talk to Elvis Presley, I don't know anything about him, I've never listened to a song, I know who he is, but I, what am I gonna to say to him? So, but they figured it was worth doing. So it was very awkward as you can see famous picture. So the best Nixon could come up with as far as chit chat was, that's quite a get up you have on Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> and Elvis's answer was, you have your audience Mr. President and I have mine. <laughs> that was a pretty good answer. But anyway, Nixon got his picture and Elvis got his badge. And that was uh, uh, an intersection. But, but uh, Nixon was another case of not being a celebrity in chief. He really lost the luster of the presidency Every president has someone when they're first elected. Um, one other little sideline as far as sorry, participating in popular culture, um, which President Obama does, and I'll talk a lot about that in, in a minute. But Nixon, of course, lost the 1960 election to John Kennedy. Then he loses the California election for governor. 
two years later, and he gave the famous press conference, you don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. People felt he was washed up. He goes back and he runs in 1968 as the new Nixon. So he decides he's going to go on television on one of the most popular shows, if not the most popular show at the time. Remember, it was Laugh-In. Remember Laugh-In? A lot of these quick cuts, very jokes, one rapid fire after another, and the signature phrase on the show was, sock it to me. So they decide, the producers decide, let's have Nixon say sock it to me. Just show him saying those four words, you know, it'll take four seconds, and then it's gone. So they have Nixon in the studio trying to record it. He doesn't really get it. Um, he says, sock it to me, sock it to me, sock it. He goes on, and so finally he gets it right on like the eighth try, and they use it, and it's a big smash. Uh, but he really wasn't very comfortable doing it. But he tried to portray he was likable, he was a new Nixon. Now, he really wasn't, and we did learn that after he took office, but nevertheless, he did try to participate in popular culture because he understood that was necessary. So we have that about Nixon. Now we come to President Ford. President Ford, of course, succeeds Nixon. Uh, President Ford had a lot of negative imagery associated with him. Very unfair because uh, a lot of the negative imagery associated with him was wrong. He was actually a graceful, athletic man. This is a picture of him as a football player in Michigan. He was actually author of pro contracts. He passed it up to go to law school. Uh, he was a very athletic guy. Um, he was a skier. I actually got to know him a little bit when I was working at the Denver Post at the time, before I came to Washington, and he would go skiing there, and he takes spills. And you remember the pictures he had taken of him, he was very accessible. He let the media take a lot of pictures of him, and he, the pictures that the media used were pictures of him taking falls on the slopes. And, um, you know, we all fall. That's what happens when you ski. And so I remember interviewing about it, um, him about it, and I said I was at the Denver Post, and he and this was in Vail, and he said, oh, so you're with the newspaper that's always running pictures of me falling down. <laughs> so I said, yes, Mr. President, I am. And he said, well, it's nobody's fault but my own. He said, I'm the one who let the photo photographers on the runs. I'm the one who took the fall. So he was very magnanimous about it, and that's, that's really the way he was. But he really couldn't convey this to the country, these positive qualities. Um, Again, another example of his athleticism. He's, he's uh, showing some fancy footwork with Pele, the soccer star. So he was, uh, this is the kind of image that was not used a lot. Uh, but he had a lot of problems with Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Talk about the, uh, the uh, negative imagery and sort of the reverse celebrity. Because uh, he got the reputation, unfortunately for him, of being clumsy. And so Chevy Chase started to come up with these skits and playing Jerry Ford, bunking into things, tripping over things. Again, very unfair to Ford, but they were funny. And Ford recognized that himself, and so Ron Ness and his press secretary actually went on the show to try to take some of the edge off it. I don't think it worked very well, because I think Nesson started, was, was sort of part of the gags, and I don't think it was a good, such a good thing to do. But then Ford tried to capture the issue by appearing with Chevy Chase in Washington at a formal dinner and it was actually a very good moment because he showed up at the dinner and he had his papers for his speech and he pretended to lose track of them and threw them <laughs> all over the podium. And it was, got a big laugh and then Chevy Chase came up and they had a big laugh together. But he never could escape that notion of, uh, of being clumsy and uh, it really hurt him. Uh, and uh, he just was not able to turn that celebrity corner. He did try in many ways. So he had a lot of celebrities of the time in the White House to show he was reaching out to people. He wasn't just try insulated at the White House as, as Nixon had been. This is a case where he had Billy Preston and George Harrison. Billy Preston, a famous um, uh, and a musician, and George Pre Harrison, the former Beatle. Hairstyles were a little different then, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he tried, but he never could escape. And in fact, in researching this book, and other books I came across, handwritten notes from Jerry Ford at the library in which he said, I've tried to reach out to my critics, I've tried to reach out to the entertainment industry, I've tried to reach out to the liberals, I've tried to reach out to the Congressional Black Caucus, but I realize now that they're never going to forgive me for being Richard Nixon's vice president, and he was right about that. So uh, it was unfortunate, I, got, I didn't cover Ford, but I got to know him and respect him a great deal after he left office. But he never could, as I say, 
get beyond that problem he had with celebrityhood. And of course, he loses the election to Jimmy Carter. I can't talk about all the presidents, so we'll have him move on to the pre another celebrity in chief, which is Ronald Reagan. He was a Hollywood celebrity, of course. He was the only president we've ever had who had been a TV and movie star. I'll let you judge whether his movies were any good, you know. Bedtime for Bonzo was not in the, in the Academy Award competition. Uh, but um, he understood the importance of celebrity as a politician. Even uh, when he was in Hollywood, he understood when a role came up and you really wanted it, you had to go after it. And so he realized that there was a movie being made of uh, Newt Rockney, the famous coach of Notre Dame. And there was a character in the movie named George Gipp. George Gipp was a running back, a real person. Uh, he actually got very sick and in his bed in the hospital, there's a scene in the movie with Ronald Reagan playing George Gipp, uh, saying to the coach, Newt Rockney, when the boys are, have their backs against the wall, when they need a touchdown, when it's late in the game, tell them to win one more for the Gipper. And that became his political slogan. Whenever he was trying to motivate his supporters, he would say, win one more for the Gipper. And it worked. It became a very effective slogan. And this was the, the poster for that movie. Talk about the intersection of politics and show business. Uh, Newt Rockney, All-American. Uh, this was the movie that he starred in. And this was a very important movie in his career and his political career. Uh, Reagan understood even more than any other president really on the power of television and imagery. Uh, he had been not only a movie star, but he had uh, been the host of Death Valley Days and GE Theater on television. So he was in America's homes as this genial host, and that's the kind of person he played in the movies, sort of the genial everyman. And so he capitalized that as a politician. After he was uh, almost assassinated in 1981, he realized he had to use all the powers of imagery to get beyond this. We didn't realize at the time, but he almost died from that assassination attempt. Uh, and he, talk about the, the presence of an actor and understanding the role. Um, remember, he was shot outside a hotel in Washington, and uh, one of the bullets bounced off the limousine, uh, shattered, and that's the bullet that penetrated his chest and almost hit, uh, hit his heart. Um, and uh, the Secret Service pushed him into the limousine, and he thought that one of the Secret Service agents was so rough that it had broken one of his ribs because he was in pain. He didn't realize he had been shot at the time. They took him to the hospital, and if they hadn't gone to the hospital, he would have died. But when he got to the hospital, he was in the limousine, and um, he decided that uh, he was going to continue playing the role of a lifetime, the role of president, and he insisted that nobody help him got out of the car, buttoned up his jacket, walked into the lobby of the hospital, and then collapsed. And, uh, but he, f he felt he had to project the role of strength even at this time of, he was in great peril. Um, but i show you this picture because this is the kind of thing they, they released to show Reagan was recovering, uh, working out, uh, exercising. There was a famous incident where he was in the hospital and um, he was hooked up to all these tubes and breathing tubes and transfusions and so on. But they wanted to show a picture of him in the hospital and they only showed him from the side where you couldn't see all the tubes. So it looked like he was actually doing much better. He was heavily made up too. But it was that image and this image and other images at the time. And Ronald Reagan was very, very good at blending celebrity with politics. Um, he became known for the, being optimistic for confidence by projecting strength. And this is, a, this is the classic picture of Reagan and the persona he wanted to project to the country. Um, he also uh, associated with Hollywood celebrities, even people out of his own generation. This is Michael Jackson. He decided to have Michael Jackson in uh, the White House to recognize Michael Jackson's contributions to charity and so on. They don't look like they have much to say to Michael Jackson here. <laughs> But um, he's wearing quite a getup. If anything, his getup is more interesting than the one Elvis had on, I think. Uh, but um, it worked. It, you know, Reagan did, was able to capture this, these images. And this is an image he used to project that he was trying to reach out to um, people of all generations. And so it, it worked for Reagan. Um, Bill Clinton. This is uh, another celebrity in chief. Bill Clinton, how he managed to do this 
we just don't understand because this is, he was at Boys State, which is a program for high school leaders. I was in Boys State myself. But then there's the next level is Boys Nation. And he went to Boys Nation. I think one student from, one young fellow from every, uh, every state gets to go. Somehow he gets to get in the picture with President Kennedy when he's at Boys Nation and save the picture all those years. So he used it in his presidential campaign. Uh, and, you know, he's look at the guy in the eye. This is a classic Bill Clinton. He retained this quality all his life, this, this, this intensity. When you meet the guy, and anybody who's ever met Bill Clinton knows, and I was talking to some folks last night at the, um, the Ford Museum about this, uh, he makes you feel like you're the only person he's interested, the only person in the world he's interested in at that moment. Uh, and he, he's managed to, to, to get that gift mastered. And this is, you can see some of this right here. He understood popular culture. He <laughs> did things that other presidents did not do. You know, I mentioned Nixon was on Laughing when he ran for president. He was on the, the uh, evening uh, entertainment shows. This was the Arsenio Hall show. And he showed up and played the saxophone in sunglasses. This is nothing like this had ever been done before. Some people were aghast that Bill Clinton was lowering the stature of the presidency, but he understood that people wanted the president to be more uh, grounded in everyday popular culture, and he was indeed that, and so this worked for him. After he became president, he didn't do a lot of this because he was concerned about lowering the stature of the presidency, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but um, this is uh, election night. There's Michael Jackson again. Looks a bit different here, doesn't he? Um, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, this is Bill Clinton with Chelsea, his daughter, looking very young, and Diana Ross, formerly of the Supreme. So you can see he's keeping his connection to the Hollywood culture. Loves crowds. Loves to use his celebrity to call attention to himself and his agenda. He did this very, very deftly. He tried to represent the notion that the country wanted movement again, wanted uh, some action in Washington, and so it was sort of a Kennedy-like feel to it combined with a little bit of Franklin Roosevelt. To this day, he's energized by, crowd, by crowds. He's still a celebrity in, um, in our country. And, um, but he did carry this self-indulgence too far. Uh, you remember the Monica Lewinsky issue that he was impeached for having uh, an affair with a former White House intern and lying about it under oath. Uh, this is some of the coverage. I covered all this. Uh, it was a very very gruesome time to be covering all this. We we're writing about things we never thought we'd be writing about or covering about sex in the White House. Uh, but one key thing that Clinton did, he used his celebrity to do a fundamental thing. He managed to persuade most people in the United States that they should assess the president separately on his private character and his public leadership. Up until this time, we can converge the two. Clinton said, and tried to convey to his pollsters and to his public impressions, okay, I might be a scoundrel or a rascal in my private life, but I'm a good president, I'm a good leader. The country's relatively prosperous, we don't have a big war going on, and people did make that distinction. I mean, he was impeached and then acquitted, but it was a terrible year, he was very mortified day after day with all these revelations, but in the end, the country felt they put his private character aside and evaluate him based on his public policies. And that was a very fundamental turning point in our presidency in the United States that Bill Clinton managed to do. This is Bill Clinton today, still a very gregarious guy. I have many, many stories about Clinton having covered him, uh, about how he, uh, him in person, was the same in person as he was in public. I can't say that about every president I've covered but uh, was tremendously interested in people. There was a case where, just as an example of this, where um, uh, and he's, he's not only just uh, trying to learn from people, but he's, he just needs to be around people. He needs to have people to draw attention from and to draw energy from. We were coming back from Australia, and I was in the pool of reporters that always travels with the president. We have a little compartment in the back of Air Force One, the president's plane. Um, you know how long that flight is from Australia. Uh, and uh, we're about halfway through, 10 hours, had another 10 or 12 hours to go. Um, I'm standing in the press cabin, everybody's asleep, I have a Coke in my hand. 
I'm thinking, how am I going to pass the next 10 or 12 hours? And then I hear, hi, kid, how are you doing? <laughs> well, we know who was there, Bill Clinton. He had eluded his minders. Everybody was exhausted and asleep, and he just wanted somebody to talk to. And he made his way through the cabin. Everybody was asleep. Senior staff, VIP cabin, Secret Service cabin, lesser staff, press cabin. There's Ken Walsh. So uh, at that point, my, I had to decide in, in the press corps, in the pool, the press pool, you have to give everything you learn in the press pool to your colleagues. That's why you're there, because everybody can't be with the president. You have a little group with him. So my, my question to myself was, do I wake my colleagues up? The TV cameras would come on, the lights would come on, it would become a mini press conference, and he would be gone in five minutes. Or do I just talk to him myself and brief to my colleagues later? And what do you think I did? <laughs> I had my 45 minutes with President Clinton. And, um, but that's the kind of thing you really want and, and sort of live for as a White House correspondent. Those moments with the president when the president is letting his guard down. And you saw this incredible public celebrity uh, who basks in the attention. He talked about just an amazing range of things. You saw the intellectual curiosity, his mind at work, the leaders he had met, how he sized them up, the uh, economy of the Philippines, the Great Barrier Reef, and he talked about going snorkeling and how he, his shadow passed over a giant clam and it closed up. It was huge! He said, I don't know why he was so impressed with that, but he was. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you got that insight into Bill Clinton. So anyway, he takes this notion of celebrity in chief to another level, and he's still a celebrity in our politics, which I'll discuss in a moment. Now we're to the current times with President Obama. Runs a night in 2008 as a candidate of hope and change. This is the famous poster that was used in 2008 to represent that. The hope poster, the change poster, this is the hope and change poster. This is the most vivid of them. And he did capture the imagination of many Americans. He was thought to be a celebrity from the first day he took office because he was the first African American president. And he capitalized on that celebrity very well. Um, he was thought to be a new type of leader. He was going to bridge the differences in Washington. He was going to bring excitement and glamour to the presidency in positive ways, echoes of John Kennedy. Uh, in his first year in office, he won the Nobel Prize. And he himself said, I don't know why I got it. I didn't do anything yet. And, uh, but he won the Nobel Prize basically on the notion of him as a celebrity, as a peacemaker, as a new type of leader, and uh, it came as a surprise to him as well as a lot of other people. Uh, but he does, uh, he has brought this whole celebrity notion to another level. Um, this is him on that first uh, uh, election night where he wins. Boy, haven't the daughters grown up since then? This is Malia and Sasha. They're young women now, uh, if they're six and a half years. Um, and uh, Michelle, of course, the first lady. But right from the beginning, he tries to connect with popular culture. He decides that the presidency has become too isolated, so he tries to break out of it. He does things like this plays pool. Of course, he brings the cameras in. He likes to, to have a White House. It's a very sophisticated public relations operation. This is him playing pool in Denver with Governor Hickenlooper. Uh, he does a lot of the shows that other presidents did not do. Leno, Letterman, now he's just Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon. Um, he does The View in the afternoon. Uh, he does interviews with YouTube celebrities, including someone named Glozell, whose claim to fame is that she ate a box of cinnamon and almost threw up during her show. Uh, she has nothing to do with politics or government at all, but she has a lot of young people who watch the show. So he's, what he's doing, based on the polling that the White House does, he's, they sliced and diced the electorate to such an extent that they feel they can appeal to different demographics in very specific targeted ways, and that's what he set about doing. Most Americans don't get their information anymore, mainly from people like me in the mainstream media. They get it from a lot of different sources. Uh, Fox, the conservative TV network, MSNBC, the liberal one. Um, you can find any philosophy or any way of thinking reflected on the internet, and so people get their information in many, many ways, and President Obama is trying to reach out to people through those different venues and find ways to communicate with them. Some people, as I say, traditionalists are upset by this. They feel he's lowering the, the stature of the presidency. But I think that this is what presidents are going to have to do 
for the foreseeable future. They've got to go where the voters are and where they're paying attention, so I think he's onto something here in the kinds of things he goes to. He's appeared on another show, The Between Two Ferns, which is Zach Galifianakis. How many of you have heard this, of this show? Uh, well, some of you have, but uh, this is a fellow who um, does a parody interview show. He has people on the show and he insults them. That's the whole notion of the show, insult your guest. So President Obama, because of his survey research and so on, realizes he's, this guy Galifianakis has a tremendous young people's following. So he goes on the show and he insults the host better than the host insults him. <laughs> A lot of people watch the show and he uses it to make a pitch for his health care law. Sure enough, hundreds of thousands of young people sign up for the law, for this program. So it works. So it's an example of how Obama's on the right track here. This is the way people learn things. Uh, you know, John Stewart, comedy shows, but this is the way a lot of people absorb information these days and this is an example of it. Uh, he does associate again, as I say, with uh, celebrities, this is Bruce Springsteen. Over time, uh, Democratic presidents have managed to dominate endorsements and support from Hollywood. That's uh, sort of a given these days. Hollywood f and entertainment industry people uh, support Democrats. Uh, and President Obama is very, very popular in the Hollywood crowd. The only real celebrity group that the Republicans do well in our country and Western singers. I mean, seriously, that's really where they get a lot of support. Uh, and, uh, and country and Western stars. But uh, for Hollywood in general, uh, Springsteen, um, Oprah, uh, Obama is very popular in these groups. And um, so anyway, this is, uh, so it brings us, up, brings us up to the current president. Again, Obama redefining celebrityhood uh, in ways that other presidents have not done. Uh, reaching out to the voters in different ways, becoming, uh, appealing to his basic constituencies uh, and enhancing his celebrity within those constituencies even though he knows he cannot enhance his celebrity or even build on celebrity with people who don't like him. He's sort of written them off and they've written him off. So he bases his, uh, his presidency on about half the electorate that likes him. His polling is about 45%. It's been that way for a long time based on women particularly single women. Single women comprise 25% of the electorate now. People don't realize this, but it's a very large group. Single women, um, African Americans, Latinos, young people, new voters. That's Obama's coalition. Enough of the white vote to get him up to about 50%. But you can see what he's doing with this celebrityhood. Is he's appealing to those constituencies inexorably. And this is working for him. And as I say, this is what I think presidents are going to have to do in the future, Democrat or Republican. We'll talk a little about 2016. There are two celebrity candidates out there on each side. Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton, this is her at Wellesley College. Hillary Clinton uh, always thought of herself as the future leader of the women of her generation and the future leader of her generation. From a very early age, she felt that she was going to be a very important person. And uh, she succeeded in doing this. She gave a famous commencement speech uh, when she was at uh, Wellesley and um, it got a lot of attention at the time. So right from those days, she was right at the top of the publicity chain uh, as a celebrity of sorts. Um, she becomes first lady. That's when I got to know her. I got to know a little bit during the campaign when they ran and won in 1992. I got to know her during those eight years when she was first lady covering her husband. Um, very smart, but understood that uh, she could use celebrity to her advantage. She picked the wrong issue, however, by picking health care, one of the most intractable issues we have, and it failed. The, the, the Hillary, Hillary Care, as they called it at the time, and she was in charge of it for her husband failed in Congress, and so she had a tremendous setback. Uh, then she decided to pull back and be less uh, controversial. And then, of course, uh, she ran for Senate from New York, and uh, Ben became more of an iconic figure again. This is a New York Magazine photo of her Hillary Clinton superstar. So obviously, she's building on her celebrity. She is now the most, probably the most famous woman in the world. 
and everybody knows about Hillary Clinton. It used to be when I first covered politics that the, the uh, Republican consultants would say the candidates should always use their last names. She's broken that rule. She's thought of as Hillary. Some feminists complain. They say it's disrespectful. But Hillary Clinton uses the, her first name in her campaign literature. She feels that this is the way she wants to be known as Hillary. Because it's like Cher or, you know, or Bono or whatever. Uh, Beyonce, you know, uh, it's Hillary. And so she's, she's a tremendous celebrity herself. Um, she is now running to be celebrity in chief, uh, to follow in her footsteps, the footsteps of her husband, who was celebrity in chief. It's the first time we've had two super celebrities running for president. Uh, and, and, and I say both of them running because remember when he ran the first time, he said, buy one, get one free. <laughs> now she could say the same thing. The, the question is how much she's going to sort of sail close to her husband's agenda or set out on her own. And she's starting to separate herself a little bit from her husband and use her celebrity to, uh, and harness it to call attention to herself in her own persona. Among the areas where she's diverting from her husband are in criminal justice, law enforcement. She's saying under her husband, they adopted these incarceration policies that locked up too many African American men. They flooded the country with police officers. They uh, gave the country uh, mandatory minimum sentences, which she now says is excessive. So, and I noticed the other day Bill Clinton agreed with her. He said, well, maybe I went too far with some of those incarceration policies. So anyway, so he's on the, he's on the bandwagon. But anyway, two celebrities now running as a couple. It's very interesting. Is, is she going to let Bill uh, be fully out there running uh, a separate campaign on her behalf. She says he won't, but he can't seem to resist <laughs> getting the attention. I don't think he's going to be able to throttle back. And as, as so many times Saturday Night Live captured the essence of it, they had a skit a couple of weeks ago where Hillary is about to run, announce she's running, and she can't restrain herself. She's sort of brittle. She's trying to be more likable and so on. And all during the skit, the guy playing Bill shows up in the back. He's waving at the camera. <laughs> at one point, he comes in with the saxophone and starts playing it. He gets in front of her. And I think that's a real concern <laughs> that, that he's going to, I mean, it's not quite overshadowing her. It's just uh, sort of trying to just dominate attention because he can't give up this celebrity notion himself. She's got another celebrity she's got to deal with, and that's Barack Obama. She was his secretary of state. So here's another celebrity factor here. How close is she going to steer to the Obama agenda, particularly on foreign affairs? She's starting to separate herself from Obama in some ways as well uh, to try to set her own path and so on. She noticed she hasn't endorsed this big trade bill that President Obama is pushing, um, even though she helped work for it when she was Secretary of State. So there's a lot of uh, questions about how she's going to handle this this celebrity notion. Uh, this is Hillary when she ran for president in uh, 2008. You know, th and this is the same image you're getting today, although she's trying to be more um, on a listening tour than a self-promotion tour. I don't think that's going to last too much longer, but this is basically the way she is on the campaign trail. She's a pretty good campaigner, not as good as her president, her, her husband, the former president. So anyway, we'll see how that plays out. So, but anyway, so you have this celebrity factor, and I think in Hillary's case, it's not so much building celebrity, she already has that. She's got to harness it and channel it in positive ways. You might have noticed during the, the, the first days of her campaign, um, she didn't harness it very well. She had a huge number of reporters following her around, and she didn't, you know, when you do that, you got to what they call feed the beast. We, we're the beast in the media, and I wrote a book about this, actually. Um, you've got to give the media something, or the media will go out of control, and that's what happened. You had reporters looking absolutely ridiculous, chasing her car, go, look surrounding a school, trying to figure out what entrance she'd go in, just so they could get a picture of the back of her head in the car. It was ridiculous. So you have to give the media something, and she's starting to learn that again. You think she would have understood that after all this time. But anyway, it's a matter of harnessing the celebrity, which she has not quite done yet, and uh, directed it properly. Now, on the Republican side, the celebrity there is Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush was governor of Florida. This is him when he was governor of Florida for two terms. He uh, was quite a popular governor, but he hasn't run for anything in a long time. He's sort of rusty at it, but he has the celebrity factor in a different way than Hillary does. This is him now. 
running for president. Uh, he hasn't announced yet, but he's doing everything that a candidate would do to run. And we think one reason he has not announced is because he's reinventing the campaign financing part of the presidency by not declaring himself a candidate. He can have his super political action committee, super PAC, raise unlimited amounts of money as long as he doesn't coordinate them when he's a can candidate. So what he's doing is, and we don't know how much they're raising because they don't have to report it right now. And it's, it's you know, people can, can dump millions of dollars into this uh, pack. So what he wants to do, we think, is let this pack operate separately, but run the negative part of the campaign. Rough up his opponents in the Republican Party. Rough up the Democratic nominee. So he doesn't have to be the nasty person and he can use his money to be the positive side, while the PAC has millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, do the negative side. Now, we don't know if it's gonna work, but that looks like what he's doing. It would be very clever, actually, if it worked, because it would reinvent the whole nature of campaigning. But uh, now they figure each major party nominee is gonna need two billion dollars. Last time it was one billion dollars, and, and they raised it both Obama and Romney. Now they're thinking of two billion dollars. We can't fathom how much money this is, but that's what they do. But getting back to the celebrity notion purely, Bush has a different type of celebrity problem, which is the dynasty problem. His dad, George Herbert Walker Bush, was president. His brother, George W. Bush, was president. So he wants to be the third Bush to be president in a generation. We've only had two fathers and sons who were presidents before, John Adams and John Quincy Adams. Here you would have, if he wins, a father and two sons within a generation. And it's, it's very unusual. And I know, remember a, a year ago, Barbara Bush, <laughs> the spouse of uh, the elder Bush, Jeb's mother said, we've had too many Bushes as president already. She said, the country was sick of Bushes. Uh, this is her own son she's talking about. She's trying to send a message publicly for him not to run. And she says, surely a country of more than 300 million people can have more than two families who occupy the White House, the Clintons and the Bushes. And a lot of people agreed with her. But uh, Jeb decided, he, for all intents and purposes, he's going to run. That we, there's every sign of it. And so now Barbara has uh, pulled back. She's saying, no, I was wrong in what I said earlier. Uh, my son will be a fabulous president. So she's, uh, she's changed her mind. So anyway, so this is sort of the, I, I, would, I could go on about this whole field, but uh, I think we should take some questions now. Um, the, the Democratic field is pretty much set. If Hillary Clinton does not stumble, I think the nomination is hers. You have Bernie Sanders, a Democratic self-identified socialist senator from uh, Vermont who's running um, you have Martin O'Malley, the former governor of Maryland, who looks like he's about to run. Jim Webb, the uh, former senator from Virginia. None of these candidates look like they'd have any chance against Hillary Clinton. And of course, who gets forgotten in all this is poor Joe Biden, the vice president. He would ordinarily be at the top of the ladder as the vice president of a sitting president, but he's even not even mentioned hardly anymore because he's not considered a serious candidate. He's tried twice before and lost. Anyway, and then on the Republican side, um, you know, there's 17 candidates in various levels of running or considering running, and there's probably about 12 of them who are serious candidates. They could be around for quite a while, so it would just take me too long to go into them all and the scenarios for each one of them, but basically the celebrity point is best illustrated, I think, with Hillary Clinton and the Bushes. So with that, I'd be glad to take questions on this or whatever else you'd like to talk about. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, th I think we have some microphones if anybody wants to, or a microphone there at the center. Thank you for coming and talking, and it was interesting. Thank you. I did notice that you uh, didn't talk about uh, Carter and uh, the younger Bush. Uh, my question is uh, about Ronald Reagan. It seems that he managed the press the best as far as, and also public relations, in how uh, he managed Congress when he had an opposing Congress, and he managed to go to the press 
and uh, the American public to push through uh, legislation that he wanted to get passed, even when Congress may have been opposed to it. And uh, by doing so, he avoided the so-called uh, shutdown of, of government, uh, where uh, Clinton and uh, uh, Obama, uh, I guess, I didn't manage that quite as well. Uh, could you uh, talk about that? Right. Well, as far as Carter and the younger Bush, uh, all this is in the book. <laughs> if I'm trying to keep it to an hour, I really can't go into every president. I was trying to give you some highlights of this celebrity in chief notion. Uh, I do not think that Carter or the younger Bush were celebrities, particularly by the end, the time they ended their presidencies, by the way. The short version is that Carter squandered a lot of his celebrityhood by being stubborn and not understanding that the country was never going to go along with a lot of his policies. Uh, his personality came out too much as the stubborn, inflexible guy who was not this gregarious, happy talk fellow in public. He was not that way in private, and I think that became clear. And the younger Bush, the short version of that is that um, uh, privately, he was a very interesting and engaging and, and, and uh, really fun person, but couldn't convey it publicly and became very stubborn about connecting with popular culture and being part of popular culture and um, using his celebrity. Some people admire that, but in the end, I think it limited his effectiveness. So anyway, that's the short version. As far as getting along, I think you're wondering basically how Reagan did it successfully in getting Congress to, to uh, go along with him and why that doesn't happen again. Is that sort of basically it? Yes, because uh, he had a Democrat Congress for, yes. I, I believe, his whole time, like Tip O'Neill, for example, and he managed to, uh, if Congress wouldn't do what he wanted, he would go uh, okay. uh, to the American public. He would hold a press conference or... Right. Well, a couple of things about Reagan. I covered the last two and a half years of Reagan. Uh, the Congress was much different then. The Congress was not as deeply divided and intractably divided as it is now. In those days, you had what they called the bowl weevil Democrats, the conservative Democrats from the South. They don't exist anymore. They've been defeated and Republicans have replaced them. Republicans who are die-hard opponents of everything President Obama wants to do. So, for one thing, the Congress was different. Congress was less intractable. The Republicans and the Democrats. You had figures like Howard Baker and Bob Dole on the Republican side who, work, who did work with the Democrats within Congress. That doesn't happen nearly as much now. I mean, compare Harry Reid to a Bob Dole or a Howard Baker. It just doesn't compute. Uh, and now Harry Reid's the minority leader instead of the majority leader. So anyway, it was a different Congress. The other thing is that even though uh, today we have a lot of criticism about um, being people, about divisiveness and so on, there, there was some divisiveness in, in Reagan's era, certainly, but I think the country was much more willing to listen to the other side as a general rule. And I think Americans are less willing to do that now. We are very divided and polarized as a country. Just look at the media. You can, you know, we're divided between Fox, the Fox Nation and the MSNBC Nation, and the, the one side doesn't listen to the other, and that's part of what's happening in Washington. It gets very difficult to do. And also, Reagan was terrific at mastering the media and communication. They didn't call him the great communicator for nothing. He was very, very good at this. Uh, part of it was, as I say, uh, his celebrityhood. People just felt he had a certain aura about him, and they listened to him. People, people were willing to pay attention to Reagan and, and at least listen to what he had to say. There's many, many stories about this. Uh, his mastery of news conferences, of interviews. I interviewed Reagan a number of times. Um, he was not particularly helpful in interviews, but he would always have a, a, a tape go off in his head and he'd re repeat speech lines. Speech lines were actually very good, but think of all the moments for Reagan that we remember, his public moments, his public speeches. How many of them do we remember for President Obama? We remember the Challenger explosion. We talked about the, ast the astronauts dying and touching the face of God. A wonderful, wonderful speech. The Boys of Point de Hoke, the speech at Normandy. We remember that. Even the reporters were crying at that speech because he had all these soldiers, these, the Boys of Point de Hoke who would storm the cliffs at Normandy, were now sitting in front of him as old men and he was paying homage to them. So he could capture the moment and that's a very rare quality and that's part of what, what made Ron Reagan effective. He could really master the moment. 
and we haven't had a president able to do that very well, or nearly as well as Reagan. I think Franklin Roosevelt could do it, but Reagan really did it very well. And I say that without any partisanship whatsoever. I'm not a pundit in any way, I'm a reporter, so I hope you don't know my politics, but we, I think we have to give Reagan his due as a tremendous communicator, and I think that's part of why he was able to get some things done. So, anyway, I hope that addresses your question. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. I've had a, a question, and I wondered if it's celebrity or with Obama's um, uh, legal background, on his early comments in some of the high-profile racial cases uh, throughout the nation where within a day or two he's made a pronouncement and perhaps you could uh, right. uh, comment on that. Right, well I actually wrote a book about the uh, presidents and, and uh, race called uh, Family of Freedom, uh, Presidents and African Americans in the White House. Um, President Obama has tried to be careful, particularly in early in his term, in dealing with the race issue. I, I interviewed him about this, others have interviewed him, and he said he doesn't want to be known as the black president, he wants to be known as the president. So he's tried to walk this line. We know where his heart is. He has felt particularly that uh, African American men have had a very difficult time in our society, including him in his younger days, with racial profiling, with uh, harassment and so on. And so sometimes he, he, uh, he does, I think, reveal his innermost feelings. Remember earlier on, there was the famous case where uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Gates from uh, Harvard was arrested trying to get into his own house when he had lost his key. And the cop arrested him and took him to the jail, didn't believe that the identification he showed was, was legitimate. So Obama made the mistake as so often happens, the last question at a news conference, he was a bit t tuckered out at that time and a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, snarky, and he said that the cop was stupid. Now he had to backtrack from that. And remember, what came out of that was the beer summit, where he had the cop and the professor meet on the south lawn of the White House over beers. Okay, whatever. But anyway, so he's tried to be careful. But more recently, he has been, I think, more blunt about it than he has been. He always tries to say that law enforcement has a very tough job and the cops are needed and we have to respect the police when they do their job as well. But then he always comes back and says, there's a tremendous amount of abuse. African Americans have to deal with a lot of uh, prejudice and, uh, and bad law enforcement. And I think that's where his heart is. I think you're gonna see more of that as his presidency proceeds. He has allowed his attorney general, up until now Eric Holder, to carry that message of uh, taking on uh, the problems in law enforcement and, and a lot of racial issues in law enforcement. Now he has another attorney general, Loretta Lynch, who's doing it. Uh, but I think that uh, what's happening is that the law and order issue is coming back. And that is an issue that the Republicans have used against the Democrats for many years very effectively. Republicans saying the Democrats are too weak on crime. Now partly Bill Clinton got that out of the picture through those policies I mentioned earlier, the incarceration policy, uh, throwing people in jail and throwing away the key, that kind of a thing. And crime rates have gone down. And so I think Americans in the end might prefer that to the idea of lesser penalties, but we'll have to see how that works out. Uh, but basically, I think the law and order issue is back, and I think President Obama is going to be addressing it uh, increasingly from the perspective of protecting African Americans from abuse. I think you're going to see more and more of that in his remaining time in office. Oh. Wondering if you could expand a little bit on the, for the lack of a better word, proper relationship between perception and substance. I guess I'm keying on one sense in your book, right after you say, as you've talked about, the leader, successful presidents must engage the nation, hold its interests, exploit the mass media to promote their agendas, then the next sentence, if this doesn't happen, the country tunes out and the result is a decline in a president's job approval rating and erosion of the ability to get things done. And in your interview on the Washington Journal, you talked about people have an ingrained perception of Hillary Clinton. It strikes me like, I would say Franklin Roosevelt's fireside chats and Eleanor Roosevelt's action, you had a great chapter on the First Ladies, that that, that had 
great substance as well as uh, uh, received as a good perception, whereas some other things, Obama going to five guys or whatever, doesn't necessarily equate with that. So should there always, or what would be the, the best relationship between perception and substance for a president to be right. successful? Well, I will, thank you for the question. Thanks for referring to the book. That's great. I have somebody, we have some, a, a well-researched question. That's great. I wish we did that more in the White House press corps. But, uh, but basically, um, one thing I do also in the book is I distinguish between shallow celebrity and consequential celebrity. So I'm, I'm trying to address exactly what you're saying. Shallow celebrity is, you know, like these endless uh, talk show folks, the, the, the actors and actresses who, who are very famous for, for one role or another and then they fade. Uh, they sometimes talk about political issues, often don't know what they're talking about, but are basically uh, using their celebrity just to call attention to themselves just because people are curious about them from roles they played or whatever. Consequential celebrity is the kind of celebrity that I think is most effective for presence. As you mentioned, Franklin Roosevelt had this, Eleanor Roosevelt had it, not only in her uh, dealings with the media, but she wrote a column every day, five days a week for years. I write a blog every day and it, it's pretty taxing. And she was first lady, so she had a lot of other things to do. But, uh, but it, it was consequential. And I think that's the problem that the modern presidents have, ha have in doing things that don't seem to have much substance or consequence in them. The problem they're dealing with is that our country is so celebrity driven, our, so, our, our, our um, attention span is so short that sometimes that's all people want is just sort of a little, little taste of the substance because they don't have the patience to learn much more about things. Uh, sadly, I think that's true, but I think that's the problem presidents have. Um, you know, just as an example, the average sound bite the average amount of time that the networks give, the broadcast and the cable networks give people in politics a chance to talk unencumbered, unfiltered, how long do you think it is? Seven seconds. Now how could you possibly address issues in seven seconds like that? But they, they have found in their marketing surveys that that's, that's all people want. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna stay with it. You know, some people will. But most Americans, if you want to get clicks, as they say, or page views, or uh, traffic on your website or on your network, the way you do that is these quick hits, lots of them insubstantial, lots of them shallow, but that's what presidents have to deal with. And President Obama is actually, I think, doing pretty well in trying to inject some substance in it. Um, lots of times, by the way, when people meet him, they think he's too serious and substantive. He's not as engaging as they think he would be. Uh, there's not a lot of chit chat. He's not interested in uh, sort of the lubrication of relationships in politics. That, that I, I find that's true. A lot of people in Washington feel that's true. Um, but he, he, he does give substantive answers. Uh, by the way, when he gives news conferences, which he doesn't like to give, he spends basically in an hour's news conference at least 10 to 15 minutes in an opening statement giving a speech. Now he's trying to be substantive, but he gets a lot of criticism for that, for filibustering. <laughs> and so when he gives a news conference, the first 15 minutes are a speech. There's 45 minutes left. In that time, he would call on maybe eight to 10 reporters. Other presidents might have called on 15 to 20. So he calls on all the network correspondents whose networks are covering the press conference live. So that's, let's say that's uh, CNN and MSNBC and Fox and uh, say there's four or five. There's three to five questions left. He'll call on a minority reporter from an African American outlet or, or an African American. He'll call on a Latino, he'll call on a liberal outlet. There's two questions left. He hasn't gotten to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the, Was the US News, the one after another. So you can imagine the pent up frustration in that news conference at the end. And many times he doesn't get to the major mainstream media. And so now is he trying to be substantive? Is it just him trying to have his own way of getting his message out in his own intellectual way? I'll leave that to you to decide. I think it's a combination of both. But basically, when he tries to be substantive, he gets criticized for uh, boring people or for just taking up airtime without moving on. So, you know, 
this is the, what the presidents have to deal with. So I think Elaine tells me, I think we, we got one more. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Um, you've already mentioned talking about like recent dis uh, divisiveness in current politics. Uh, you, please speak into the microphone. I know you're Sorry. tall. So I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you've talked about with a few of your answers how local po um, current politics are much more di uh, divisive, much more uh, rancorous than they were in the past. And just kind of growing up in this age, I've noticed that, you know, looking at Obama and Bush, it seems like um, their celebrity status um, has attracted both praise as well as just rancor and absolute opposition. And so I was just wondering, in researching this, have you seen that same spirit of opposition and you know, perhaps even hatred in former celebrity presidents? Absolutely. Uh, I wasn't meaning to say that politics weren't as nasty or nastier in the past. We're more polarized, but that doesn't mean we haven't been angrier at each other. It's hard to, uh, to convey to some younger folks how nasty politics were in the past. Remember during Lyndon Johnson's presidency, Lyndon Johnson was reviled by young people. When I was in college, he was hated because of the Vietnam War. He couldn't speak on campuses around the country because violent protests would follow him. He was almost a prisoner of the White House. When he would speak, massive rallies would erupt, and you know what the chant was? Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? You don't get that today. That's pretty nasty. But that's what we were living with back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, so when people mention how nasty politics are today, boy, it was nastier then. People were just angrier. Uh, you, you, people would get into fist fights over issues and so on, from Vietnam to law and order to race, all kinds of stuff. You don't get that as much. Now, people are divided, and maybe the reason we're divided is we've self-segregated ourselves into our little ideological compartments, and we don't interact with other people the way we used to. Maybe people would get angry and start fighting with each other if they engaged more. <laughs> But they don't. We're living in these, these compartments, I think. And so I think that's one reason uh, we're so polarized, it is uh, we're not talking to each other. But as I say, we have gone through this period before where uh, I think anybody who lived through the, the 60s and 70s, we, we, we were going through a nervous breakdown as a country. And uh, things are really flying out of control. And so I think to, that, to the extent that we're beyond that, I think is a good thing. So anyway, so that's the short answer. But anyway, thank you so much for coming and have a great spring. You can see why we invite Ken back. Uh, he does great research, he's so knowledgeable and really takes an even-handed approach, which I appreciate very much. Since you've gotten every other possible president that we give to speakers, we have something a little bit different. It's a Gerald R. Ford. Uh, talk back with some goodies inside. Oh, so thank, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. I'll let you know. Okay, I'll go down.